Hey, you're listening to The James Altucher Show on YouTube. You're gonna hear directly from peak performers who have defeated all odds and decided that the only way to be truly successful in a world totally out of balance is to choose yourself. I upload a new video every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So, subscribe to my channel and click on the bell notification now so you don't miss a thing. So, super excited to have Maria Konnikova back on the podcast. Maria, how's it going? Good. How are you doing? Good. And Maria, it's going actually extra good for you. Just a brief intro. You've been on before when you came out with your book. I just want to get the name right. Uh, uh, oh, wait, I have, it, I have it here. Came on with the book, The Confidence Game, Why We Fall For It Every Time About Con Men and Your Study yeah. of Con Men. You also wrote the bestseller, Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes. Both books were New York Times bestsellers. Got your PhD from Columbia about risk and decision making and uncertainty. And you all, I feel like all of your interests have combined into what we're going to talk about on this podcast, which was your next book that you were planning was going to be how you started off with essentially zero skills at poker. And you were going to spend a year studying with the best poker player in the world and seeing how far it could take you to, yep. in, in terms of learning. And then it's taken you so far that you've been making a ton of money, you know, compared to the average salary, you've been making a ton of money playing poker now, just a year or so later, and you've even postponed the book. Yeah, yeah. No one could have predicted that this was going to happen. I could have predicted it. Oh, I, thank you, I knew you. I knew you were there. Well, we played, so I played poker quite a bit 20 years ago. It was 1998, yeah. 1999. I played at, you know, all the clubs in New York, and we played once, we played a couple of times, and you were already, like, just dominating. And so I could see this was, you were, you were going a long way. Not that I could really judge these things, but what was like the last tournament you played in? Um, so the last tournament I played in, I just got back from Monte Carlo uh, for the European Poker Tour. Um, Sounds very exciting for, for a writer. Yeah, yeah. It was actually my one year anniversary playing poker. So my first ever big tournament was Monte Carlo last year. Um, so this was my one year on the, on the poker circuit. Um, it was very exciting for a writer. Um, I never would have done anything like that. Otherwise, I mean, OK, so I, I didn't end up doing that well, but I played a tournament that has a twenty five thousand dollar buy in, which is more than my first salary in media when I started out in New York, which is just absolutely insane. And what was the last tournament uh, you you? Oh, this is my my phone. What's um what's the last tournament you made money in? Um. Well, so I, I did cash in, in one tournament in Monte Carlo for like five thousand dollars, a little more, which which was fine. But when you, you when you play a, a bunch and they're kind of big tournaments, I'm still negative for the trip. That was not a very good trip. The trip before was to Macau, um, and I came in second um, in one of the tournaments I played, and that was almost sixty thousand dollars. So that was sixty thousand dollars. So yeah. altogether, how what are your poker winnings? Um, so over the last year, um, I have made a little over two hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred thousand dollars. And and when you started, did you? What did you know about poker when you first started? Nothing. Zero. Zero. Literally zero. Like, did you know the? Do you know the order of the hands? No, I didn't know how many cards were in a deck. Why did you decide? Okay, I'm gonna pick poker and um, do a book on this on learning it from zero on. So I wanted to write about luck, and we've talked a little bit about this before, kind of the role luck plays in our lives. Like, what is luck? You know, how much of our lives do we control? How can you maximize what you can control? How can you learn to tell the difference between what's skill and what's chance? You know, how do, how do you actually make decisions that way? But that's, that's not a book. That's, that's a huge question that gets very existential very quickly. You know, like and, what, uh, what are your beliefs about the universe? By, by the way, there's a book I just saw recently. I think maybe it just came out about the science of luck. Cool. I, I don't know where it was, but anyway, I don't think that's what your book no, became no. about at all. Um, and so I, but I wanted a way into this question. Um, and I read a lot. Um, and when I'm doing research and starting on a new project, I just read for inspiration and try to figure out, you know, is anything clicking? Um, and one of the books I, I came across um, was John von Neumann's Theory of Games, which is the foundational text of game theory. So I had zero background in game theory. I mean, I have zero background in math. The last time I'd done any sort of math was in high school. Um, so game theory was something that I'd never even considered. But someone said, you know, you might look into game theory because game theory is all about kind of decision making and, you know, taking into account chance. Can you can and you describe just what does the phrase game theory mean? 
Um, so game theory means if you actually kind of look at the world like a game where everyone has certain payoffs for certain decisions, um, given that, what is the best way for you strategically to make a decision um, so that no one can, quote unquote, exploit you? Um, if you have a game theory optimal decision, that means that given all factors, the way that you are acting is the kind of best overall over the long term decision for the situation. Okay, so let, let me give you an example which someone asked me about yesterday, which I find to be very interesting. And and first off, I do think you've dealt with game theory before because a book about con men sure. is all game theory. Right, right. So the I con just man is playing a game. Yeah, yep. yeah, and the conner is playing a game. This is true. This is true. I just I, I had never I have never done it before. I had never done it in a formal way. Like okay. I never really knew, you know, how to apply that specific framework. So, so here's a here's a classic thing yeah. in, in in business. Um, uh, you have two. Uh, somebody presents you some godlike figure presents you with two opportunities. Yep. One is you have a hundred percent chance to start a business. Mm -hmm. or you, have, you, have, you, have, you in both cases you could start a business. In the first case, case A, you have a hundred percent chance of building the business and selling it for a million dollars in a uh -huh. year. Hundred percent chance you'll make a million dollars in yep. a year. In the second case, you have a 1% chance of selling the business in a year for a billion dollars. Now, in a game theoretic sense, the case B is the better choice because uh, the expected value is 1% of a billion is, is 10 million mm -hmm. as opposed to 1 million. Mm -hmm. But I would argue case A is actually the one a person should take. Absolutely. And and so okay so so I'm not wrong in thinking this way even from no. a game theoretic point of view. I mean, you know, you have to you have to keep in mind human psychology, right? And and the fact that the 99% of the of the time when you make zero, are you the type of person who can afford that? And for most people that that's actually not the case. You actually would rather take the sure thing even though it's less. Right, cuz once so, you have the million then you'll have then you the next opportunity exactly, to build exactly. a business that can make a billion. Exactly. So we need to we need to take it that into account. Von Neumann would have actually agreed because so this this is what brings us to poker. He was a poker player and he I didn't realize that game theory came out of poker. He actually invented it in Monte Carlo. Oh, um, yeah. That's well, so interesting. Yeah, I didn't it, know that. Yeah, it was it was it was pretty cool for me to learn that. Um, and he said, you know, poker is a much better analog for real decision making than chess than go than any of these other games i, I agree that having having played extensive each one of those i've played for several years yep. each so go chess poker and you became I, really good at them yeah all, all three i mean i won't say I, I probably played played each one the same amount of time and so in chess um ranked the master and go i was about one don if you know the ranking system there poker who knows but uh, but I played about the same amount of time mm -hmm. each. I would say po poker is much more reflective of human decision making. Right. Um, and so that's what von Neumann said. He said, okay, this game, it's a game of incomplete information, right? Rather than chess, where there's always an optimal solution. You can see it because there, you know, everyone sees the board. And so theoretically, there's always a correct move. In poker, there's no theoretically always correct move because there's private information. There are things that I know that you don't know. There are things that you know that I don't know. There are things we know in common. Then we have to play each other as well. You know, what do I think you know? What do you think I know? And it gets into the human psychology side of it. It gets into bluffing and kind of trying to figure out how can I win even if I'm actually not in the best situation in terms of my cards. And von Neumann was like, this is life. This is actually the model for strategic decision making I want to use. Um, and he was advising um, the national government of the United States at the time. Um, he was working on the hydrogen bomb. And he actually thought that poker, like solving poker, would help prevent nuclear war. It's um, so interesting because he's he's probably correct. I mean, look at look at the 1950s. Yeah. The, the Soviet Union, which had everything going wrong, a backwards economy even then. Um, who knows where their what their nuclear situation was like, but they had such bravado. Yeah, they, they basically were playing as if they were had a pair of aces in the hand. Yeah. And uh, for all we know, they had nothing. Exactly. But but they they mastered the game of poker in this in this case because they knew against, you know, Kennedy, a young yeah. and experienced Kennedy that maybe they could they could bluff their way through. For sure. For sure. So this was this was actually. When I read that, I was like, this is really interesting. I, I want to figure out what this poker thing is, because it did seem to me like it would be a really good way of learning about, you know, about decision making, about about people, and that it could be a way to kind of 
a rubric for life, so to speak, right? Uh, that there, learning there, to play could could make you much better at making decisions. There, there's other everywhere. elements too. Like I I remember so I, so I've seen this kind of um, let's say genre several times, and you have too. Which yeah. is, so for so there's one there's, there's the genre of starting with zero, yeah. studying master players, and then actually becoming a participant. Yeah. So Stephen Fatsis wrote Word Freak and Scrabble. Josh Foer wrote about becoming the U.S. Mm -hmm. Memory Champion. But even in other areas, like, you know, people we both know have considered books about venture capital or entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. like starting with zero knowledge yeah. and then playing. But the great thing about poker, even as opposed to Scrabble or memory, poker, there's this huge dopamine factor. Like you play, a, a hand lasts about 60 seconds and right away you win or lose. And so you get, you're constantly getting these dopamine hits and you keep on playing. So there's there's a kind of a pleasure, there's an addictive quality to poker too. Sure, and there's also, this is actually really important for learning because that's reinforcement. So if you're playing correctly, you're actually learning in a really good environment because you are getting these hits, you are getting reinforced for certain types of decisions. And does that rewire yes, the, the brain? Yes, I mean, everything rewires the brain, mm -hmm. but this actually, it makes you learn better. Um, and poker is a type of thinking that we really suck at. I mean, it's probabilities. It's trying to kind of figure out kind of these little edges. Um, and the human minds is really bad at, at all of that kind of probabilistic but, thinking. And we suck with un uncertainty. We don't like ambiguity. Like we're, we're actually pretty ill-equipped to make decisions based on incomplete information. We always want more information, right? Right, right. Because uncertainty is, is, has an evolutionary bias in the sense yeah. that let's say 70,000 years ago, you passed by a bush that suddenly started rustling. You don't know why it's making this yeah. movement. Is it a tiger or is it the wind? Yep. So you can't find out logically, you have to just run because <laughs> if you don't want to take the chance that yeah. it's a tiger, yeah. it's not like a 50, 50 thing. Right. Exactly. So, so, so you see this in the stock market all the time. If there's uncertainty, even if chances are the uncertainty is nothing, stock market's going to go down. Yeah. So like if, if Trump has a weird tweet overnight, the stock market's going to go yeah. down. And, and you see this in the stock market all the time for the past 400 years. Yeah. And uh, with poker, no matter what you have, the other guy's bluffing and you don't know what's in their hand. You yeah. get scared. It's yeah, uncertain. Exactly. Exactly. So poker actually like immerses you in uncertainty. And if you if you want to get good at poker, you have to become more comfortable with that. You have to wrap your mind around that and you have to actually learn to overcome it, even though I don't think anyone will ever completely overcome it. I mean, it's still uncertainty scary. But but let's say, can you boil it all down to probabilities in the sense that, so there's the, there's the basic probabilities that, um, you know, you get a certain hand, you're going to be dealt more cards. Sure. What's the probability that you're going to be dealt a flush before yeah. the hand's over? Yeah. That's like a basic mathematical yep. probability. But then you have other people or, uh, in the table who are betting and you could assign probabilities. Well, what's the, what's the probability that they have yeah. A, a flush based on how they're betting. So you, you can try to boil it all down to probabilities, but that's much more difficult as opposed to the pure mathematical probability. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why poker's so hard because there is no right answer because it's all a matter of like taking all of these uncertain elements and then trying to, you know, boil them down to a probability, which I mean, I, I don't even know how one goes about doing that in real life like imagine you know you're in a business negotiation and you know exactly what you're bringing to the table but they don't know what you're bringing and you don't know actually if you're in a position of strength or weakness and so much of it is on how you're presenting yourself and you know trying to figure out what they you know who has more to lose like you're you're, you're playing poker with each other if you're actually uh, absolutely to do this. i think it's I'll, it's funny. I talk about this. So I have a, a business partner that I do a lot of investing with for the past 20 years. Yep. And um, I would say 95% of our conversations are not about the business or not about the products. They're not about how the products are doing, you know, in terms of all the companies we yeah. invest in. 95% of our conversations are about the people involved. And we practice how we should talk to them yeah. in different scenarios. And what if they say this? How do we respond? Like, it's almost all about the people. Yeah. And that's huge. I mean, that's how you run a successful business, right? I mean, you need to figure out how do you read these different people? Because everyone is different. You nego you talk to them differently. And and obviously, in, in so we're, we're doing this podcast in my favorite place, which is the stage of stand-up New York uh, uh, during the day. So there's no one in the audience. But 
on the stage here, doesn't matter how, just like it ultimately in poker, it doesn't matter what cards are in your yeah. hand. It doesn't matter how funny your jokes are. If you don't present them with confidence and power to the audience, yeah. like you, like you're the one who belongs here and they don't, yep. no one's going to laugh. Everyone's going to, the, the audience is an x-ray machine. For sure. And, and I always think in poker, this is what, like, I remember, and again, I haven't played seriously in, in 20 years, but you could always tell the people who are just coming in off the street just to play to have fun because, you know, they're a little nervous. They're thinking a little too much about their cards before they make their move. You just get this uh, uh, enormous sense that they're not being honest with you. Yep. <laughs> As opposed to like, you know, professionals, you know, are tricky because they're they're planning several levels deep, not what their cards are, but how you might be thinking yeah. about what their cards are. It's all about presentation and power yeah. and controlling the audience, controlling yeah. the table around you, controlling controlling yeah. who you're negotiating with. Yeah, and it's it's controlling yourself and presenting yourself in a confident way. And then also being able to read people and figuring out, you know, this guy looks nervous. I can exploit him. You know, yeah. I can actually. People, I, can bully I think people this forget guy. that completely. Yep. Um, and actually reading the table and adjusting to it. What, what and, would you say is more important? The and I'm sorry I keep interrupting. Yeah, it. interrupt but, away. But, but and because I, I want to get back to the original story of how you how you got into it and then got the book deal and then started. But um, what's more important? The the reading the not bluffing, which people often confuse with reading the people, but right. uh, reading people and the people around you, or the actual cards and mathematical probabilities in your hand. I mean, they're both important. Um, I don't I don't necessarily want to say that one is more or less important because your cards do matter to a certain extent because it's all extra information, right? So like if I, you know, if I'm holding aces, like that makes it much less likely that the other guy has aces. Right, um, but although so, uh, you have Doyle Brunson who said, uh, you know, and maybe he just said it to be cocky. So he's a, a two-time World Series champion, maybe three, I forget. Um, uh, and he said, you know, he could play without he could he could play and win a tournament without ever even looking at his cards. So so people have actually tried that. Um, there have been there have been a few cases in history of people playing tournaments without looking at their whole cards. And I think it's doable. And I do think that a lot of it is reading dynamics, picking spots, figuring out when you can do certain things. Um, so that's huge. Um, in my in my mind, that's a, like that's at least you know that, that I would say like at least 30 40 percent but I don't know if I would go so far as to say that it's over 50 percent because especially these days when the players are playing in very precise ways you kind of have to know that information as well so that it can help you figure out what they're doing so okay so so I, I want to get to that later which is kind of what you know I, I want to lead this through um, the, the the backstory then um, kind of the process of learning and what we talked a little before the podcast about the so-called 10,000 hour rule and how and in your process of learning. And then we'll, I want to get into a little bit more specifics, but we'll, we'll generalize them enough. So so you 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 decide you were reading John von Neumann. Mm -hmm. he, he, he's obviously a fascinating, charismatic character. I mean, inventor of the computer games. Yeah. He, there was all these class of guys like John von Neumann, Cloyd Shannon, Ed Thorpe, who just Brilliant. Like they, they were brilliant. <laughs> they were there at the beginning of computers, but they were fascinated by all sorts of like yeah. weird games. Like Ed, Ed Thorpe, uh, you know, made the first wearable computer in order to beat Blackjack in Las yeah. Vegas. So I don't know if you read his book, which was just a brilliant book. Um, and uh, but anyway, so John von Neumann, essentially reading that inspired you about poker. Did you start reading? There's lots of great books and stories about poker players. Did you read any of those? Um, so, no, at the beginning, I just started looking kind of at what this game of poker is. So I, I just I went online, um, kind of started reading a little bit about the game and realized that, you know, well, if John von Neumann says it's a good analogy for life, then that's pretty good for me. You know, I trust that guy. He's kind of smart. So um, that's when I decided maybe I will learn poker, find someone to mentor me to kind of accelerate my learning um and I wanted, was that was that instinctive or you knew that having a mentor is a good way to learn because I, I knew that having a mentor is a good way to learn because like I've, again and anders erickson who's been on this podcast um and who writes about the ten thousand hour rule his whole point is if you do something if you do something for ten thousand hours with deliberate practice you could be among the best in the world and part of deliberate practice is having a very strong mentor 
Yeah, for me, um, I, I wasn't thinking about 10,000 hours or anything like that. I was just thinking that in my experience, um, what the way that I always like to do new things, learn new things, you know, my favorite thing in the world is surround myself with people who are smarter than I am and better than I am, because that gives you something to strive for. That gives you something to aspire to. It's inspirational and it kind of, it's a really wonderful way of learning. So my entire life, I've always tried to have people in my life who are much better than I am. I think, I think that's so critical. Like, uh, I mean, I'll, sh I'll take investing as an example. When I like, uh, again, I'm dating back 20 years, but when I thought I was good at investing, I lost all my money. When I actually started associating myself with the best investors in the world, I became a good investor. And again, with chess as a kid, I took lessons from the US champion. With Go, I immediately, because I remembered my, how I learned chess, when I started learning the game Go, which is a, the most popular game in Asia, po most popular board game in Asia, I took lessons from the Chinese amateur champion who was living in the town I was living in. Uh, with poker, I started associating with the best poker players, mm -hmm. but I didn't have a coach like how you had. So, 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 so you decided to go for a mentor. How did yep. you pick your mentor? So I did some research um, and the name Eric Seidel really stood out because most poker players peak and then go away. It's a really hard game. It's a game that keeps evolving. It takes a lot out of you. It's changed a lot in the last 30 years, 40 years. Um, so it's very rare to see someone who has consistent success. And Eric stood out because he started in the 80s, um, came in second in the World Series of Poker. Famously, yep. <laughs> famously portrayed in um, the movie Rounders, yep. cr cr written by the movie Rounders, written by uh, Brian Cobbleman, who's been yep. on this podcast talking about Rounders. But Eric yep. Seidel is in the in the video that uh, Matt Damon is watching. Yep. Uh, Johnny um, Johnny Chan Johnny Chan, be, you know, bluffs him and and yeah, it's and it's him. a three person video. Johnny Chan, Eric Seidel, and Eric's red visor. Yeah, <laughs> the, the visor needs a character of his own. And he's just <laughs> and, and and they just and then Matt Damon just yeah. is like watching that scene. He's just analyzing and just loves it. Yeah, for sure. So that was Eric's kind of big debut on the poker scene now fast forward to 2018 the guy's still crushing but he, by the way also he was the world backgammon champion yeah he was before that he was the world backgammon champion um so he has won multiple world series of poker bracelets um he is the number two all-time money list um person in the world Who's used number to be one? number one daniel negrano is okay. currently number one they're very close can, um i still i still think that you know eric will regain the number one spot but can i tell you i've never played poker at a table with eric seidel but again in 1999 or 2000, no, 2000, I played uh, poker at a tape for like all afternoon and night at a table with Dan Negreno. And this is again, almost 20 years uh -huh. ago. So he was a young kid. Yep. He, you could just see it. And we were playing high stakes. It yep. was, it was still the time when limit hold'em was more popular than no uh -huh. limit, but we were playing about 300, 600. Wow. And he just, young guy, cause he must've been like 20 or 21 uh -huh. or something. He was just controlling the table. Like he yeah. would not, let like he was making jokes he was commenting on each yeah. hand and it was I it, I it always impressed me that the best poker players took great effort to control all the language and conversation and everything around the yeah. table well Daniel's unique in that way um because he's a, obviously a very strong player um and he does kind of have that confidence and that control but he's also really good at speech play so a lot of poker players are quiet they're pretty silent and I try to be kind of more quiet when I'm in a hand um, Daniel extracts a lot of information from talking. I love how you call so, it speech play. I've never heard that yeah, word. So yeah. what, does it, what does that mean? It means that you're playing um, with, with your words as well. So if I engage you in conversation, I'm hoping that you're going to give me some information when we're in a hand together about the strength of your hand. And I'll see how confident you are. I'll see how not confident you are. Um, I'm going to try to get some verbal tells as opposed to physical tells. And because he's been doing it for so long, he probably is really good at understanding, oh, this person just went from being blustery and loud to quiet. Right. So, going on. so speech play is really, really hard. Um, and I would say don't, don't do it because most people can't do it well. And you often give off more information than you take in when you start talking. But Daniel, that's actually, that's one of the things that he does incredibly well. And so I'm not at all surprised that your memory of him is, is about kind of him talking. Yeah. And I, I just table. kept thinking to myself, man, I should hire this guy for something, which was obviously <laughs> stupid because how much cash has he made now yeah. from poker? 
Uh, not, not counting his cash games, just how much has he made from tournaments? I think about 34, 35 million dollars. Yeah, and how old is he? He's younger than he's he, younger than Eric, yeah. I think he's in his forties. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure exactly how old he is. But um going back to Eric, so this is it's almost unheard of to have someone be consistently winning coming in first for three decades. I mean, that's insane. So I was like, this guy clearly knows what's up. And not only coming in first in tournaments, but he's great in cash games. And yeah, he plays he plays tor- tournament is you buy in. And then whoever wins the tournament wins the mm-hmm. prize. Cash games is just you take your own money and you're gambling. Yep, yep. Um, you're playing a game of skill. Yes. <laughs> um, so so yeah. Um, and Eric also seemed nice. I watched some videos of him, and I wanted you know the the other important thing about mentors is you want someone who's who's going to be actually a good person and who's going to mentor you. And he seemed like he was a good guy. Um, he, and just a little I know of him and. By coincidence, he lives in my building. He seems like such a sweet guy. He is. He's amazing. His whole family is amazing. Like his his wife, his daughters, like they're they're all they're the best family in the world. I, I got very lucky. Um, and I feel like I'm kind of a part of the family now. What why did he agree? So you approached him. Yeah, why I approached did he agree? him totally randomly. Um, and I actually approached him on Twitter. <laughs> um, Twitter's good. Twitter's yeah. good that way. Um, and I, the so- I social media. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and I sent him a message and I said, Hey, um, You know, I'm a writer for The New Yorker. Um, I'm working on my next book proposal. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about it because I think that you could be helpful, Um, basically. I didn't give him much more background than that. Um, And it ended up that he was in New York at the time. Um, So I I had no idea that he split his time between Las Vegas and New York. Um, And so we ended up meeting in person. um, And I told him kind of what I wanted to do. And I said, you know, I'm a writer. I have a background in psychology. Um, you know, I've written about con artists. I've written about Sherlock Holmes. Um, this is the kind of stuff I'm interested in. I want to do this, kind of learn poker, use it as a way to explore all of these different themes in life. Um, will you help me on this journey? And he thought it was really an interesting project and also a really cool opportunity for him kind of to test out his philosophy of poker. Um, This goes back to your earlier question, you know, how much of it is kind of the mathematics and how much of it is the other stuff, kind of the psychology and all of that, because he does have more of a psychological approach. And so if he could train me from zero, I mean, I'm a blank slate, which is actually a kind of a, a really good opportunity for a mentor because I don't have any bad habits either. I have zero habits. I, I don't know how to play the game. So he can actually kind of program me in a way and and teach me a certain approach to the game and then see if I can end up being successful. That's huge, not just for his approach, but for the game. And he loves poker. He's really passionate about it. He wants to bring more people to it. And if if someone like me can actually become good, then that's huge. And that's huge advertising. Well, well and I think also uh, the kind of book you were planning on writing, yeah. that is the sort of uh, type of thing that brings people to a sport or activity. Yeah. Uh, much in the same way, I think Stephen Fats's book, uh, Word Freak, brought a lot of new people into yeah. Scrabble. And I think Rounders brought a lot of people yeah. into poker back in the 90s. I think Chris Moneymaker winning yep. the World Series brought a lot because he was a beginner, yep. um, supposedly. And 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 he brought a lot, you know, him winning a million dollars or whatever it was brought brought a lot of people into poker. Bobby Fischer winning the World Championship yep. brought a lot of in, in, in chess in 1972, brought a lot of people into chess. Mm-hmm. So kind of like a combination of, um, you know, winners uh bringing a whole new cohort into something or writers who win right uh showing that that documenting the process of going from from zero to to bazillions uh you know oh i could do this they read your book they read your story they read how to do it and and you get in yeah absolutely and you know now that i've been in the game for a year and that i've actually kind of embarked on this project um, and really delved into this world, it's one of those rare instances um, where, you know, as a writer, you often, you start a project and you're never really sure how it's going to work out, right? You don't know if your original idea was good. You don't really know if it's going to pan out the way you thought it was. This is one of those rare moments where I said, oh my God, this is even better than I could have even imagined. Not just because I've been doing well, but because I've actually developed a passion for poker and a deep and a belief that poker can actually improve your life in so many different ways because it forces you to deal with so many things on and you know not just intellectually but emotionally mentally it's it's a it's a full body sport. I I think that, I totally think that's true. I think I could probably list 10 to 20 different ways 
completely unrelated to poker that my infatuation with poker for several years, 20 years ago, changed my life and made it better. And I didn't have to be a poker champion to do it. You don't have to be the best in the world to have it change your life. Yep. I always sort of feel with anything, there's a learning curve, which um, obviously is steep at first, and then it flattens out. Mm -hmm. I th kind of think I right at that point where the curve flattens out is usually when I stop. <laughs> and <laughs> But if that's the point I need where I'm already better than 99% of normal civilians, yeah. and then I can use those skills to help me in other areas of life over those, you know, in, in the other things I compete in, which, which is against those 99%. Yeah, for sure. And I think that poker is one of those things that actually helps you on levels, at least it's helped me on levels that I never, I never thought that it was going to help me on. Like, I didn't realize how big of a, you know, emotional and mental game it is. First, it's so, it's such a beautiful game. It's so addictive. It's because of the dopamine hits. <laughs> uh, of course, it's gonna, and also you're gonna, you get extra dopamine, you're gonna be one of the only women at the table. So that has its negative side, but also it's like, it, there's a specialness to it. So you're probably going to get extra um, dopamine from beating all these men at, at what they think is their game. <laughs> That's it's definitely um, really because at the beginning um, and this is still true, but less true than it was at the beginning. I felt like such a total imposter and I had huge confidence issues. That's really and interesting. It, and it made me realize that I actually have confidence issues unresolved in my everyday life that I didn't really realize were there because I'd, you know, I'd had a good career, you know, I'm good at what I do. Um, and so I always thought, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident. Like I, you know, I know how to do this. Poker made me realize that I'm actually not, that it's very easy for people to push me around. Well, well, because you're playing this, you're, you, it's not like something you're doing from your home at, uh, typing into yeah. the computer and just by yourself. You're with a group of people, mostly men, yep. who are part of their job is to intimidate yeah. you and lie to you to take your money. Exactly. And they, and it worked. That was the horrible realization that I had at the beginning. I was like, oh, my God, they're bullying me. I know they're bullying me. They know they're bullying me. They're they're just playing me rather than play the cards. And I'm letting it happen. I can't play back. I don't have the inner fortitude or the strength. And like, you, you couldn't play good until you got over this. Exactly. So, it, so, was, okay. it was huge. No matter. And the thing is, I was actually learning a lot of strategy. I was studying really hard. And I knew there were these moments at the table where I knew exactly what, what I should do. And I couldn't do it. Like, I, I actually. Like, what's an example? Like, for instance, you know, when someone, you know, would would raise my bet and I knew that they I knew that they were bluffing and I knew that with this you know in this situation with the cards I had that I should actually just re-raise them because that would get them to fold a lot of things and I knew this and I was sitting there and I just fold and you and and even and they probably raised you a, there was probably a little element because they knew she's a woman exactly and she might be intimidated Exactly. Whether they're right or wrong, that's how they're probably exactly. thinking. Exactly. And so I knew, so even when I identified that, I knew that that's what they were doing. And so they were likely raising me with nothing. And I knew this. And, you know, intellectually, I know you don't have anything. I can just, I can take all of your money right now. I would just, I would just fold because, I was, you know, I, I know I'm supposed to, but I just can't. Here you go, just take it. I don't want to, I don't want to do it. And that was, it's actually, it's not a pleasant realization to have about yourself. I, I don't want to think of myself as that person. I want to think of myself as the one who's like, Hey, you asshole. Like, I know what you're doing and I'm going to take your money. And it was, I couldn't do it. Um, I want, I want to, um, well, okay. I'm going to ask this question later on. We still have to kind of get the, the, uh, backstory of how you got the book deal and everything. Mm -hmm. But er so Eric Seidel agreed to be mm -hmm. your coach. Yep. Um, it's I'm surprised nobody's ever done this before, by the way, with poker, because yeah. considering how successful they did with Scrabble and memory and other things. But uh, uh, you go to the publisher, your, your, your usual publisher. You've already had published a couple of New York Times bestsellers. So they're going to do whatever your next idea is, presumably. And uh, how would they, how did they react? So I actually ended up switching publishers for this book. Um, Why? I, you know, it's a very different book and it's a big departure for me. Um, normally, you know, I'm a journalist. That's my background is journalistic. But this is participatory it's, journalism. Exactly. But so I'm used to, I'm not used to being part of the story. I don't write personal essays. I don't blog personally. You know, I, I report. 
and I write about other people. Well, now you're different. Exactly. <laughs> so for me, this was such a huge departure. You know, I'm doing a totally different book, which is going to have me at the center, which scares the shit out of me. Like, I'm not used to being the center of my own story. It's really, it's a huge challenge, and which is which is what I wanted to me. The, you know, a good project will scare you. Like, I don't want to do what I did before. I want something that will really scare me that I'm not really sure that I can do because that's the only way I'm going to be forced to get better. Oh, I so want to write that down, actually. I thought that was really good. <laughs> All right. You don't take Plus. out a project unless it scares you. That, I mean, to me, that's that's really kind of my metric. You know, does this, does this, this scare me shitless? And if the answer is yes, then it's actually probably good. And when else have you used that question? Mantra. Well, poker, I mean, that that's actually, that's been the case in poker as well. But it's it's one of these things where like, when you want to take on a new, when you want to do something that's a big commitment, it should be some, somewhere you want to improve. Like, you know, I might learn ballroom dancing, not because it scares me, but because I just want to learn ballroom dancing. This isn't just, it has to scare you in order for you to do it. So, so, that's but it's, so, so I'm thinking like poker, I, I, and again, I'm always relating it to my own uh, simple experience with it from from a while back. Mm -hmm. But I would sit down at a table. The first time I went to the Mayfair Club, for instance, yeah. or Las Vegas, I'd sit down at a table and I'd literally be shaking. Oh, I'd be I, scared. I threw up before my first big tournament. Wow. I actually went to the bathroom I, and, and threw up. In <laughs> chess also, when I would play in tournaments, I would shake all the time. Yeah. Uh, I never actually stopped shaking before a tournament. And that's, I think that's great. That actually shows. So it was the same thing when I did like my first public speaking. I'm not a natural public speaker. And I remember forcing myself in high school to actually do speech and debate, not because like this is something that I really thought I'd be amazing at, but because I thought that this was something that I really needed to do. Yeah. Pu I, public speaking for me also, I would shake up until up until recently. Now I don't actually, which is interesting, yeah. but I until for 15 years I did. Yeah. And stand up when I was doing it so, or when I first started doing it, so, I would shake. So, you know, exactly what I'm talking about. Even when I st started my writing career, I remember sending pitches to editors mm. I really admired, pitching stories that were more than anything I'd ever done and trying to convince people that I could do it. It was scary because if they said yes, I'd actually have to do it. And, you know, am I capable of writing a big feature that's going to be a cover story? I've never done that before. That's and so to actually do that and put yourself in that position, then it forces you to do that. It forces you to improve and to get better and to actually rise up to your standard. Um, and to me, it was always, you know, when people have asked, oh, like, was the confidence game easier to write than Mastermind because it was your second book? The answer is no, because it's a different book and I want it to be a better book. You know, it's one of these things where you, the bar changes. I feel like the confidence game for you was more journalism than the Sherlock Holmes yes. books. Because you loved Sherlock Holmes ever since you yep. were a little girl. Your yep. dad read to you Sherlock Holmes yep. books. So this was something that you combined passion with your academic studies. Yep. In fact, maybe your academic studies came out of your passion. Whereas the confidence game, like now you have to sort of, in general, you know, what is puzzle-like thinking in a high stakes, yep. maybe illegal situation? Yep. And you had to do journalism and research and, yep. and so on. It was a different type of exactly. book. Exactly. It was a totally different type of book. I mean, I had hundreds and hundreds of hours of interviews, you know, spent time with these people. Not not anything that I ever did for Mastermind. And then this is yet another challenge that still, I mean, I'm so scared and I have no idea, you know, how I will pull this off. I'm going to do everything I can to make this as good a book as I possibly can, but it scares me. Well, well, okay. So, so did, did, did you approach your publisher and they said not for us or did your agent, uh, so like, my agent I, I'm just so, curious what the mechanics of this. Yeah, so no, because I knew that this was going to be a very different book. I wanted a different approach. I wanted just, I wanted someone to give me an editorial shove, you know, something that would just take me out of my element. You know, I'd been with the same publisher since the beginning of my career. I just wanted to change everything so that I could that I could kind of start this fresh and really kind of have the resources that I thought were best suited to this particular book. And so um, we ended up going to auction and having a lot of people bid on the book and went with the editor and the publisher who I thought was going to. Who's going to publish it? Uh, Penguin Press. Penguin. OK. And then can I ask how much uh, what was the advance? Um, I don't know that they would want me to say. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Was it bigger though than the confidence? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Great. Um, and, and they also said they would give me a bonus if I made the final table of the main event of the world series of poker. Which you're about to leave for in a few days. Not in a few days, in a few weeks. In a few yes. weeks. Yes. So, so, okay. So now you're off to the races and running 
And now I, now I really feel like I could start asking you questions about the process of learning. Yeah. This is some fascinating advice. So, you know, Anders Ericsson's been on the podcast. He's the one who, who he and Malcolm Gladwell kind of together unwittingly um, popularized the notion of the 10,000 hour mm-hmm. rule, which is that it takes 10,000 hours to become, um, I always go back and forth on whether is it, does it take 10,000 hours to become the best in the world or does it take 10,000 hours to reach your peak potential? Right. I think Anders Ericsson thinks best in the world. I'm going to, I'm going to go with the softer role, which is your peak potential. Yeah. So, uh, but it, it, do you believe that's true? No. <laughs> and, 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 and one of the things, one of the things I've noticed in almost everything I've done and, and I'll apply it to stand up since we're on the stand up page is that a uh, stage is that people have been doing it 20 years, meaning they put in their 10,000 hours. They will tr- trash me to no end say, no, 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 you need to put in you're 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. I didn't start getting good till 10 years. Do you get that a lot from the poker world? Now you've been doing it a year? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there, there are a lot of people who've been very accepting and they think it's amazing and good for the game and they've been very supportive. There are a lot of people who think that, like, I'm this imposter who, like, who the hell does she think she is? Like, I'll show her. Just watch until, you know. And they keep saying things like, just watch until, like, she starts losing and loses. Like, they keep saying that I just, you know, they want bad things to happen to me, basically. They so, want to prove that what is happening is a total fluke and that I'm not good at poker, that I've just gotten very lucky. So it's interesting, though, because so we, you and I have played poker probably at your three month period, yep. your six month point. Yep. And I could already see you were so analytical about every hand. Like, and I don't know how much of that came from just your own internal talent and skill at being analytical about things, how much came from the coaching you were also reading. Like one thing I've noticed about poker now, as opposed to 20 years ago is the books are a lot more sophisticated. Like they're not even just in terms of the math of them, but just understanding the psychology of every type of hand, breaking down many more types of hands. Like I would say 20 years ago, there were a dozen halfway decent books that would not even like rank in the top 50 good poker books now. And Back then, the only way I can watch poker was I would get VHS tapes of the yeah. World Series and watch them. Now there's all there was the invention of the table cameras yeah. and that you can watch the world. Obviously, you can watch, you know, thousands of hands and how they're played and the expressions on people's yeah. faces. So trading in general has gotten a lot better. Software has gotten a lot better. Uh, and you have the, a coach. Yeah. So so huge. so I could see how analytically you were. How did the coaching start? What was the first couple of things he taught you that really sort of moved you along? Well, at the beginning, um, he just gave me a reading list um, to just help me with the fundamentals of the game. Um, so I read Dan Harrington, Harrington on Hold'em. That was kind of my first real poker book. Um, then I read, you know, Gus Hansen's Every Hand Revealed. You know, there were... That, which- that was the first book I read where I realized... Uh, oh, things are changing in how poker is being taught because he went hand by hand through his tournament play. Yep. And it was just such a brilliant book, so much better than any book I had For read sure. when I was studying the game. For sure. So we did that um, and we watched some poker together. So now, you know, as you say, there's so much available online and really high quality stuff. Um, so Poker Go has you know, basically streams of all of the high roller tournaments. And so you see the best players in the world uh, playing And it's kind of, it's incredible to actually be able to see that. Um, But I also went to Vegas um, and Eric was playing in a series of high roller events. So $25,000, $50,000 buy-ins at the Aria. And um, the tournament direction there is really, really nice. And he said, you know what, this is very unorthodox, but not a lot of people play those events. You know, it's 25, 30 people. He said, if all of the people agree to let you sit behind Eric and watch, then you can do it. And so I actually went around and I didn't realize at the time that I'm supposed to be intimidated, but these were the absolute best poker players in the world and went to each of them. And I was like, hi, I'm Maria. Do you mind if I sit at the table? And they all said yes. Well, they should say yes, because potentially you sitting behind Eric could give them more information. <laughs> well, about someone, Eric's play. A, f- a few people did think that. And actually, at the beginning, Eric wouldn't let me see his cards before like he could trust me. He would show me after. Okay. So that I knew at the end what he had, but not during the hand. So I was not an actual piece of information for people. But um, so they all said yes. And this was me learning. I mean, that opportunity is so insane because I see how some of the best players in the world are playing. And then as I became friendly with um, some of the other ones, they let me watch how they're playing, too. So all of a sudden I have these inputs 
of how the best players in the world are thinking. Um, and then, you know, after after a while, Eric said, OK, you're ready to play. If you're really going to do this the right way, become a professional player and earn your money from poker, which was the idea. Right. I'm going to go on leave from the New York and I'm going to actually study and play poker full time. I'm going to see what what I can do from you know, so again, you're, you're ra raising the, the, the stakes of your risk. Yeah, exactly. So, so part of the premise is exactly. not only that you're researching this and starting from zero and you want to see how good you can get in a year, you're, you're giving up your source of income. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm no longer going to be doing any other writing. I'm just focusing on this. Um, and so he said, OK, well, we need to start building your bankroll and your bankroll is kind of the amount of money you can risk at poker total. Um, and so he started me playing at these twenty forty dollar daily tournaments off strip in places like the Golden Nugget um, to kind of get a sense of the old Vegas. And he said, until you actually start winning these, you can't play anything else. Right. Because so so the idea is twenty forty is kind of medium stakes for a tourist. Um, you need a couple thousand dollars to sit down, yep. and uh, uh, but they're tourists. They're not professionals. Yep. Yep. So they're just. They're, they're there to have a good time, not necessarily yep. to win, although they think they're going to win because right. everybody thinks they're good, but they're, they're there to to have fu fun more exactly. than, than win. So I started playing in those baby tournaments and then I started winning. My first my first tournament win was at uh, Planet Hollywood and I won, I think, like nine hundred and eighty dollars. And how, was... how long had you been playing poker at that point when you won your first tournament? Um, well, I'd been working with Eric for a few months, but that was my first trip out to Vegas to play. So it was like at the end of my first week. So, but, but three Playing. months you had been studying, say. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe two months I'd been studying all the, but and that's by... enormous. Yeah. So two months was all it took to basically be better than the average tourist. Yeah. Um, but, but two months of really hard work. Right. But the average tourist is in tourist that might've been playing for 50 years. Right. But hasn't actually put in any of that work. They just the, kind of go and play. So, so here we're still, we still haven't necessarily deviated from Anders Ericsson who argues that you can't just play for 10,000 hours. You have to have deliberate practice. Sure. Oh, I, I actually, I think that deliberate practice is essential. In fact, play, just playing could make you worse because your bad habits could get Absolutely. reinforced. And it's actually bad to play with bad players because you see bad things happening. And then you also, you learn the wrong things because you, you know, you might learn that, you know, you should always raise in certain situations because they're going to fold, but that's just because they're bad. So but is that moment, it, w w by you playing with bad players, were you then risking? No, because it was just the beginning and I knew exactly what I was doing and why I was doing it um, because I had Eric. And it you wasn't had, you just had, me. And I had and I had my it was kind of kind of this metacognitive awareness of what I'm doing, which a lot of tourists don't have because they don't want to have it. They're just there to have fun. I wasn't there to have fun at that time. I was there to learn and to see what I could accomplish. This, it's, it's a funny thing that knows between fun and work because any game I play, I yeah. can't help being like super competitive, like just any game. Yeah. And a lot of people um, uh, will not like playing because they want to just play Scrabble for fun or right. Monopoly for fun. Right. And I just can't do that. Exactly. Like I get obsessed with strategy. I couldn't agree more. I'm the same way. However, there's a difference between playing for fun and having fun. So I really enjoy poker. You know, I actually enjoy kind of the process of going through this. So I'm having fun, but I'm not playing for fun. I'm right. playing to win. Right. <laughs> and it's that's a big distinction. What were some of the mistakes? So, so, so at this point in two months, you had read a bunch of books, like mm -hmm. the highest quality books, because Eric picked and them. And watched the highest quality players. A and not only you watched them, but then I'm assuming you took notes or whatever, yes. and you would ask Eric, okay, why did you do this? Yes, this exactly. So we you had like maybe a hundred or so conversations yep. like that with, yep. with Eric. Exactly. And you would watch videos and yep. you would go over why. Like how many hours a week were you studying with Eric? Um, well, with Eric, only a few hours because he has, you know, he has better things to do than spend all that time with me. How many hours but, a week were you studying the game? Um, I was studying, I would say, an average of like, let's say eight hours a day. I was eight actually, hours a day. Yeah. So that's reading, watching videos. Yep. Uh, were you playing I, online? Yeah, I started playing a little bit online. So I'd go to New Jersey because you can actually play online in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So I, I would take the train <laughs> over over to New Jersey. Sit and down by the way, you Starbucks. would only, I remember you would only um play with the reason you had to go to new jersey because you would play with real money you wouldn't yeah. play the uh fake online where right. you, you get fake money exactly you don't want to play fake money because you want the stakes to be real um you want to actually because fake money you know you can make stupid decisions and it can be fun 
but it's it's a little bit different than knowing that you actually have so money like Nassim Taleb's notion of skin in the game. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I, I put as much skin in the game as I could, um, and so after I started doing well in those small tournaments, um, Eric let me move up um, to slightly bigger tournaments, and he said, "Okay, now you know." If so, I started playing. He was playing the twenty five thousand dollar buy in tournament at the Aria, um, and he let me play the dailies, which were one hundred twenty five and two hundred forty dollars. Um, so bigger now. But he said, okay, now you have to start winning these and final tabling these, and then you can move up. Um, and so we did that. And then I, I started winning those. Um, and so um, then we moved up to the you know $1,000, $2,000 tournament uh, level, which is kind of where I am right now. So it, remind, it reminded me of um, like Tony Robbins was once explaining on the podcast, he had to teach the Marines. Uh, he had to come up with a course to teach Marines uh, better target shooting. Yep. And what he did was he put the target three feet from them. They uh -huh. all hit bull, bullseyes. Then he moved it another foot back. They all hit bullseyes. And finally, he had it all the way uh -huh. back, and they were hitting bullseyes. And I suppose it was, it was really great results. And so it was a similar type of... Yeah, that you have, to, you have to actually earn the right to move up in the stakes and do it incrementally because the players get better, the game gets harder. And so if you'd put me straight into the really big tournaments, I, I probably wouldn't even be playing today because I would have just been so out of my element that it would have just crushed me and I would have been like you know what I can't do this I have zero talent and this is actually something that Eric said at the beginning you know I'll coach you we'll do what we can but there's no guarantee that you're actually going to become a good player you can become a competent player but we don't know if you have talent for the game too and you have to I mean you can there's only so much that you can do just by working hard so so a when did he recognize obviously you have talent you've been you've won over two hundred thousand dollars playing poker in your very first year but uh uh when did he recognize and tell you or did he ever that you might have talent or when in, when did you feel that you might have um so he we never had this conversation where he was like okay i think you have talent um but i think that you know once he saw that the rate at which i was progressing um, he told me a few times, you know, I'm really happy with where you are. You're you're further ahead than I thought you'd be by this point, um, which to me is a huge compliment. That means, you know, you're doing well. And for me, it all came together um, in January, this January, when I won my first major um, tournament. What did you win there? Um, so I won the PCA National Championship, and I won, that was about $90,000 plus a $30,000 platinum pass which is an entry to a $25,000 tournament that's going to be next January and did other players finally say oh she what did she did they say she got lucky or did they say oh she might be good both both some be said this is amazing look at how good she got others said this is a total fluke how, As how, how do you avoid be because it's unrelated to the quality of your play or maybe it is related how do you avoid attaching any interest at all in where you fit in the social hierarchy of the other players, which is judged by basically how good you are. Like that's where you fit into the hierarchy, but you have to not care about that because it has nothing to do with the game itself. Yeah. I, I mean, that's exactly right. But we're humans. We fit, we always want to fit in the hierarchy of the people of where we're surrounding ourselves with and admire and everything. So yeah. how did, well, was, was this a challenge for you? It is, but I think it's good for me that I'm a total outsider and that I have that to fall back on. Yeah. And that ultimately I can say, you know what? I'm not, you know, at the end of the day, I'm still a writer and I still have that sort of, I can, sometimes I get into these really shitty situations at the table because I am female. Usually I'm the only female. I'll sometimes go through an entire tournament that's like four days long and never see another woman. Um, in any major tournament, there's usually about 2% women, just to give you a sense of, you know, how, how small that number is. Um, and sometimes I've gotten into really horrible situations and it, they make me really miserable where people are really picking on me and like being actually mean and verbally abusive. And I have to just step outside of myself and say, you know what, this is really horrible, but it's really good material for the book. And, yeah, you know, and I'm a, and Nobody, ultimately people I'm a, should leave, you're, you've got the power <laughs> the, the, you know, the pen is mightier than the sword. Everyone should just be as nice as possible to you. <laughs> Not everyone understands that, but because I have that, that's, what's helped me deal with it. That even when, you know, I'm not doing well on the social hierarchy of poker, you know, ultimately my identity is not as closely tied to that as it would be if poker is all I had in my life. So, so, uh, you started off, uh, with a mentor who gave you mm -hmm. a, a list of great books. You started off watch, watching a lot. You started off having tons of conversations with the mentor. Mm -hmm. Uh, then you started playing, um, 
the, the, you had the target close to you, started playing the easy yep. tournaments and yep. moving up little by little. Um, it, what's interesting is I was talking once on the podcast to Frank Shamrock, who was the ultimate fighting champion for so long. And he has this concept called plus minus equal, mm -hmm. which it, your, your plus was the Eric Seidel's, the Eric mm -hmm. Seidel and the other strong players you were associating yep. with. Uh, your equals would be your peer group who are at your skill level and are equally striving. They're equally mm -hmm. passionate and are equally striving. You sort of grow up mm -hmm. together. And then your minus is people you're explaining poker to, which is like you're you're in the course of writing the book. So your minus is naturally, you're probably thinking in terms of your minus, which is your readership, which is how are you going to present this in layman's terms and journalist mm -hmm. terms so that it's a good book. Um, but did you have equals at this point where you were kind of comparing hands with people at your level? Um, honestly, not really. Um, just because I had access to kind of the best minds in the world. So, so the equals so is not I, necessarily that important. No, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it, it is in the sense that you want, you want the best mind. How, how do the best minds think through these hands? That said, I've, I've definitely met people who, um, who play kind of at the stakes that I play who, who've been great. Um, and it's nice to be friendly with them, um, and to kind of, you know, have, have people to talk to on the tour. Um, but I've never actually really talked through hands with them. I've always talked through hands with people who are better than I am. And, and so, so, so now what's, you start winning these tournaments. Are you reading more books? Like what's, what, so, so I'm not reading books anymore. Um, but I am. So right now, the way that I study is I watch, there's this, um, training site called run it once. Um, rent it once, run it once, run it once, run it once. Um, that was founded by Phil Galfond, who's been another mentor of mine and really great and supportive. Um, but he, it has a bunch of um, just really great players who give training videos on specific things. Um, like th some of the videos will be very specific, like for betting in, you know, uh, on paired boards, like, you know, something totally very idiosyncratic. And some will be much broader, like how to be a great competitor, for instance. Um, and those videos are insanely good. They're such, they're so helpful in, in sort of helping you work on certain elements of your game. So I do that. A lot of it is talking through hands. So when I'm playing, um, I'll write down hands that are interesting or that I have questions about, or that I'm not sure I played correctly. Um, and we'll talk through them with Eric, or, um, or with other players, um, and that's a huge part of, of the learning process. I've started working with something called PO Solver, um, which is a program that helps you, basically you put in kind of different ranges of hands for different players, and then it s runs simulations to help you figure out, okay, how do I play certain hands in certain positions if I want to be game theory optimal? So, so, so if I want to I, I play so in a way that, that can't be exploited by another player. So, so you set up like... You deal yourself, you know, that you deal yourself two cards and then I don't know. Well, so you never deal yourself two cards. So one of the things that you learn um, as as you kind of get better at the game is that you should never put anyone on two specific cards. You should put them on ranges of hands. So what types of cards could they have? given how this has happened. So with PO Solver, you put in people's ranges. So you say like, you know, I'm opening under the gun. So this is my range. I will open, you know, all of these pairs. I'm going to open, you know, these suited connectors. I'm going to open these high cards. That's going to be my range. And I'm going to open these 100% of the time. These I'm going to open 50% of the time. So you actually fill in the hand matrix like with mm. that range. And then um, you say, okay, I'm getting called by the button what kinds of hands is the button calling me with? So you put in the hands that you think the button's going to call you with. And then the solver will actually show you how to play every hand in your range, in that range. And so it will say something like, okay, well, if the flop comes like this, you should be checking 50% of the time. You should be, you know, betting this much 25% of the time, and you should be betting this much 25% of the with time. With that software, can you keep the same set of hands and have it just Fl uh, different flops over yep. and over again. Yep. I, I see. So, so basically given a situation, it just throws tons of, uh, processing power. Yeah. yeah. P potential possibilities for the rest of the hand at you. And you get really good at like that set of cards. Exactly. And you get good at certain situations. So you get good at figuring out how do I play over pairs on, you know, monotone boards. If I don't have a spade in my hand and the, sp and the board came all spades, um, you know, and I have two red aces. How do I play that? Okay, if someone bets, do you fold? 
Uh, it depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but 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 those are the types of things that you start figuring out. So interesting. So again, I'm not sure we've de deviated from the notion of deliberate practice, right? So it's mentors, it's uh, uh, reading and studying a lot. It's uh, and then basically questioning um, situation after situation after situation and finding out optimal play yep. as opposed to just playing. Yep. Uh, which, you know, so separating out deliberate practice from just playing. The, the deliberate and, part is questioning over and over and over again. Right. Questioning and also figuring out, you know, one of the things that I do um, that I don't know that everyone necessarily does um, is kind of what I bring to the game is not hours and hours of experience because that's what the people who've been playing for 30 years have. Um, what I bring is actually the outsider perspective and the ability to look at it a little bit more objectively and the fact that I'm a journalist by background. And so what I've been doing my whole life is observing people and actually letting them kind of tell me their stories um, and being kind of the quiet observer. And so I think what I bring is in live poker, I'm actually much better able than a lot of players to read situations and to actually come to conclusions from them and then to play more creatively as a result. So maybe the solver would have told me that I'm supposed to do this in this situation, but I'm not going to, I'm going to do something different because I can read things in the people that are going on that will, that will make me deviate from the game theory and actually play in a very different way. And if, you know, if the solver saw it, the solver would say, ah, oh, what are you doing? But, so, but it's so, good so, to know what you're supposed to do so that then you can, you can, it's, it's one of these things like you, you, you learn the rules of grammar so that you can then break them, but you need to know them first. Or you learn the rules of grammar in one language. Yep. And you're like often the best writers in the English language maybe started off in, uh, you know, like Joseph Conrad, for mm -hmm. instance, start his first language was Polish, yep. but became one of the yeah. greatest writers of English because he's able to then translate his rules of grammar into a much more poetic yeah. kind of English. And so that's it seems like that's the, the right analogy there somehow. And so so but that's this is the critical point, because. Let's say most of the great players you're playing in the at the final tables have been playing for ten to twenty years yeah. or more. What what do they have that you don't, and what do you have that you've learned instinctively? Okay, I need to exploit these skills that I've spent ten, fifteen, twenty yeah. years learning that they might not have. Yeah, so I think what they have that I don't have is first of all just experience, um, and that's crucial. And, and this applies to anything. Like yeah. let's say I'm, we're talking about negotiation or sales too. Yep. Some people have been negotiating for twenty years. But sometimes if you've been doing it for one year, you have yep. to be just as good. Exactly. So they have experience. Um, and a lot of times they have a much, you know, they have a mathematical background, which I don't have. You know, but, but the experience is interesting, too, even on the mathematical side, because intuitively they'll roughly know probabilities exactly. in many hands exactly. much faster than you will. Exactly. Because they've had that. Ex they've mm -hmm. actually been sampling for, you know, years, years and years. Exactly. And I haven't. I've been sampling for months. Um, and what I have that they don't have, I think, is kind of my the fact that my training is in kind of psychology and in people um so i have that and, and that it's outside of poker that i'm actually bringing a totally fresh set of eyes um to the game and so i'm able i think to see things about them that they don't necessarily see about themselves um and pick up on patterns that they don't necessarily pick up on even though they've spent all these years picking on people's patterns from in poker but just in poker that's the thing they mm. they don't look at other things and they you know it's it's one of those things where i feel like you know sherlock holmes and con artists have come together because i have to you know i have to make assumptions based on you know how people dress how they sit like what their demeanor is like what's something that changes. you might notice that a, a, in a poker situation that a, a hardcore professional poker player might not notice, even though it's important? Well, so a lot of the hardcore players, the ones who play very mathematical, um, if you actually look at them when they play, when they're not in a hand, they're on their phone. They actually, they know exactly how, and this isn't all of them. There are some who are the most present people in the world, but some of them, they just kind of check out because they know exactly how they're going to play. And for them, it's, it's a math problem. And so they miss a lot of information. They miss the fact that, you know, this guy's like whole demeanor kind of changes a little bit in certain situations because they're just not paying attention. They're not in the hand. Um, and they still kick my ass. They're really good players, but they're not going to pick up on that specific thing. Um, 
sometimes they won't pick up on specific dynamics, but a lot of times they will, but they'll only pick up on the poker elements of it. Whereas I might pick up on the fact that this guy seems, you know, really distressed about something else that's mm. not happening at the poker table that, you know, maybe he's actually having a personal problem that's occupying his mind right now. And so like, if he plays a hand, he has a strong hand because he doesn't really want to be here at mm. that moment. And I might actually pick up on that because I'm just observing him always. I'm observing him on break. I'm observing kind of what he's saying. I'm actually really paying attention. It's, it's, a, it's hard work. Um, and I, sometimes I'm wrong. I'm not saying that this is infallible, but that um, it's far from infallible, but it gives me just a little bit extra information. And 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 you mentioned earlier how one of the things that was that were was hurting you in the beginning was that the table could potentially bully you or yeah. intimidate you. How did you start overcoming that? Um, I you know first obviously identifying it as key, um, becoming more confident in my ability as a player, but then also just I had to work on my mental game. And actually kind of do exercises with myself. How do you do that? And say, um, well, I so I, I do do meditation when I'm playing. Um, so I'll, I'll meditate. I'll do yoga and meditate before a big tournament and sometimes on breaks. Um, but then it's, you know, self-talk <laughs> and all sorts of tricks that you learn from psychology to try to kind of psych yourself up and and feel more confident going in. And also to identify when that's lagging, like when within the game you're actually those issues are coming up again and to be able in that moment to step away so so aware, actually, awareness awareness and then and then doing something about it so if i see that happening because it still happens i'll actually i might get up and actually physically like walk around get away from the table like actually say okay like maria get over this you have to you, you have to get your mind get your mind right get your shit together or stop playing and obviously in a tournament you can't actually stop playing but you can sit out a few hands. And and are these part of the psychological tricks to boost yourself up? Like yeah. what are some of those other tricks? Um, what, what do you what's the self talk? Oh, it's just I mean talking to you, to yourself and and actually saying you can, you know, stupid stuff like you can do this, like you've got this, you know, you're you're confident, like you know what you're doing, you've been studying hard and actually focus on what you're good at. Say, you know, you're you're good at this, you've been working on this specific situation, like you know it. Don't let these people get to you. Like, well, what's a specific example where you knew you, you mo not knew, but you most likely you felt you most likely had the worst hand, but you were able to do something that allowed you to win the hand. Um, oh, that, that happens m more and more frequently, which, which is very, which is very happy because that's a great feeling. Um, there was, there was a situation where I knew I had the worst hand because I had the so-called nut low. I had the lowest cards one could Seven have two. on the board. No, um, on that particular board, I had five, five deuce offsuit, um, mm -hmm. no suited five deuce. Um, but that was the lowest hand I could have without having a pair because, um, there was a three and a four on board. And <laughs> so, so I had the nut low, um, and the hand, um, I had actually raised it on the button because it was, I think, five deuce of clubs. Um, and no, was, no one had raised before you or no one no, had come no, in? No, it, it folded to me. I would have folded if it, um, but it folded to me. So I raised it on the button, um, which is the best position in poker because you're always going to be last to act after the flop, which is great. But, but, but because so, of that, the, um, you know, the, the, everybody, everybody thinks that you're, there's yeah, a good chance you're just trying to scare everyone absolutely, out, of the, absolutely. out of the aunties. So, yep, yeah, exactly. Um, which, let's be clear, I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and the big blind called. Um, and then the flop um, came ace high um, with one club. And I, he checked to me and I bet and he called. Um, and the reason I bet in that situation is because I do have a lot of aces that I'm raising as well and not very good aces often, but you know, the ace is more likely to hit me because he didn't raise me before the flop. So I ended up betting and he calls. Um, and then on the, but the uh, not to get to so much yeah. into the weeds, but did the cold call scare you? No. Like if he had, um, if he had an ace and you're just betting, he still thinks you're trying to scare him perhaps. So if he had an ace and raised, you're probably going to go out. Uh, the cold call might be his only play if he had an ace. No, not necessarily. I mean, he, but he has so many other cards, you know, he's going to call me with a lot, not just an ace. Um, and then, um, cause there's also a straight draw on board. Um, but then the, the turn came, I think, a three of clubs. So it gave me both a, um, now a flush draw and a gut shot. Um, and so he led into me, which is very, 
odd. It's unorthodox for someone to start to lead um, in that situation, but he did. So he bet, and I decided to call. Yeah, what because what could he have at that point? It's not like he has a pair of threes. Uh, right. It's it's a, it was a strange spot, um, and so I I decided to call, but he could have a lot of draws as well. Um, and then he the river was a total blank, so I have nothing. I missed all of my draws. It wasn't a club. It wasn't a straight card. So I have nothing. I have five high. Um, and he checks, and there's no way I'm winning the hand, right? Um, and so I actually put in a huge over bet because I also realized that the way that the hand played out was really weird, and he was unlikely to have anything very strong either. So, so probably his his um, betting out on the turn Helped me. was his way of scaring you. Right. Because he had cold called yes. uh, the flop, and then... And then, but after he did that, the fact that he then checked the river made me think, okay, he can't be very strong. And so I over bet. I bet more than the pot. Um, with my five high and he folded mm. and he no matter what he had he had me beat even if he had no pair mm. um he still had me beat you know his king high beats me his jack high his 10 high beat me they all beat me um but um i definitely so in that case i definitely won with the worst hand and there's no of way, the way that the situation up. played out and i also but the other reason i did it was i saw kind of the way he was sitting on the river like I could tell that he was just a little bit uncomfortable. Hmm. Like it just looked like he wasn't, he wasn't thrilled. And then when you went, went over that hand later with Eric, what did Eric say? Oh, he was very excited for me. He thought that was the exact right way to play. Well, there's never an exact right way to play. I think hmm. there are always, and that's the thing. See, there's that need for certainty. Hmm. That's why we're, we're bad at uncertain situations. We want to say, okay, this is the way to do it. And there's never one way. It's always, there are different degrees, but he was very happy with how I played it. And he, he said, that it, it's a very good feeling when you can win a hand with five high. Yeah. So, so, so in terms of like, you know, getting, reaching your peak potential, getting to be really good <laughs> at something, getting to be in the top category, how do you think, uh, assume you have talent? Because I would say one way you would know you would have talent is you start doing something and you love it. Mm -hmm. Like if you love something, it means your brain's already kind of yep. connecting around it really fast and you're getting mm -hmm. lots of dopamine. And that probably means you, you have talent at mm -hmm. it. Um, I, maybe the, the easier it is to fall in love, maybe the more talent there is to, for something. I don't know if that applies to relationships or not, but <laughs> who, who knows? But, uh, 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 so assume you have some talent, uh, what do you think are the ways you've been able to hack the 10,000 hour rule? Because clearly you've been able to do it. You've been making money. You've been studying hard. You love the game. You've been getting better. Uh, what, what do you think are the best like three to five ways to hack the 10,000 hour rule to make, to make it down to a thousand hours. I mean, and again, uh, we're not, this is all sure. Sure. Qual, qual, there's no quantitative way. This is more. absolutely. And I mean, obviously practice is incredibly important. And I think one of the reasons that I've gotten good is that I have practiced a lot, not just doing it, but just immersing myself kind of in this world. And right. But eight hours a day, but, 365 no, 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 days. No, no, no. I'm, I'm nowhere close to 10,000 hours. Plus it would all be 10,000 hours doing different things. I've played this year for maybe 2000 hours. Um, but I think that the most important thing for me, and I think that this is important for anyone doing something new is that having self-awareness and actually having like a more metacognitive approach to actually like figure out what, what's happening and not, not to lose perspective because one of the things, one of the reasons that I've picked up on things that poker players don't pick up on is because they're immersed in the world. Like to them, they, they don't actually step outside and figure out what's happening, like analyze it and figure out, try to figure out like, what am I doing? But, but what's what, happening? What you're saying is and, not just self-awareness though. What you're saying is you're also borrowing from the 10,000 yeah, hours you've put into exactly, journalism. To borrow, yes. So borrowing from my outside experience and bringing that to bear and figuring out, okay, how do I, what do I have? I don't have 10,000 hours in poker. What do I have? You know, what are my strengths and trying to focus on that and figuring out, you know, how can I make my strengths actually work for me here? Um, you know, how can I make the game more about that? How can I put it, how can I put it on my territory? Um, because I want people to play on my terms and not on their terms. I don't want to be the one they're bullying. I want to be the one who's actually in control. It goes back to what you were saying when you were playing with Daniel, you know, taking control of the table. You know, how do, how do I do that? How do I actually figure out a way to, to leverage what I do have? Because let's forget about me catching up in all of these other ways with people. It's not going to happen um, because, mm -hmm. you know, I know that they've, you know, I just, there are certain ways that I can't compete. So let's not, let's not try. Right. So like if you're not a, a math genius, you're not going to be able to intuitively 
know all the probabilities exactly. as well as someone who's been doing it for 10 or 20 years. Exactly. Um, and the other thing, though, is there are resources today that people who were starting, you know, even 10 years ago didn't have. Um, and so like when I use something like the solver that actually, you know, solving one hand and playing around and figuring out, you know, how all of these different things, permutations on different boards work. Well, that right there is maybe the equivalent of, you know, 100 hours of experience playing, not quite 100 hours. But I do have I do have kind of access to resources. But, but all of those but all of those people are using those resources too. Now they are. Yes, now they are. But so it, it doesn't necessarily get you. Uh, it'll get you better than 99 percent of the people who don't play in tournaments. Right but it won't get you better than a tournament no. players. And it's also knowing how to use your resources. I think a lot of people um, don't know how to do that well. Like I, you know, I know I'm very comfortable and this. I think one of my strengths has always been, you know, the ability to say, I, I don't know what's going on. Help me. Mm. Um, a lot of people can't, can't do that or won't do that. You know, they, they won't admit their limitations. And I'm very comfortable saying, you know, I don't know. Um, can you help me out, please? And just and this asking is related for help. to the self awareness part. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's really important because that helps you. I think that that helps you improve much more efficiently, because you know you, you're if you're comfortable sucking, like you have to be comfortable there too. Like I'm yeah. not I'm not saying I don't want to win, but I have to also acknowledge that you know what, I played really badly. Like I I still. I'm still struggling with all of this stuff. So even if you're feeling like after you lose a tournament and you play poorly, you're feeling really bad probably because you didn't get the dopamine that your body now requires. Um, but you have to somehow be comfortable enough with it yeah. to anal look back and analyze it. Exactly. And I, I think you have to, you have to divorce yourself from the outcome. And I think one of my strengths is now has become kind of my mental game. The fact that I'm actually able to separate, you know, the process from the outcome. And be like, you know, if I played well, it's good. Even if I lost, if I didn't play well, there's a problem. Why didn't I play well? And I, you know, it's interesting because obviously you've read Annie Duke's book, mm -hmm. uh, Thinking yeah. in Bets, and she refers to that essentially that you have to uh, just always separate out the process from the outcome. You have to know that you made the right decisions. Yep. And then in the long run, if you're making the right decisions, then the right outcomes will happen. Yeah, for you know, sure. Presumably, you if you have the runway for that to happen. Yep. So, yep. which is what we discussed earlier about uh, when we were talking about game theory. Yep. Yep. So, and, and then also I think, and, and I think this is true of any skill, like just trying to break it down and figure out, okay, you know, what is it, what is it, what are the elements that I need to kind of get good at to be good at poker and kind of what do I already have? How can I approach it creatively? So I, 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 I refer to this as like, uh, cause I, I've written a little about this. I refer to this as micro skills. Mm -hmm. So with poker, there's the mathematical side. Yep. There's reading the players. There's controlling the table. There's, I guess, for deeper micro skills is knowing how to play each position on the table, uh, knowing how to play different types of things yep. that you would use with the solver. Yep. Uh, knowing uh, how to control your emotions. Yeah, knowing how to control your emotions. And your mental state. Learning and, how not to let fatigue get to you. Like there's there's a lot, there are a lot of those skills that go into it. And in like in like chess, for instance, there's the, the, the obvious things is the opening, the middle game and the end game, which are completely distinct mm -hmm. from each other. And then there's how to play different types of openings, how to play different types of tactical situations. So I don't know if you ever um, studied the Polgar sisters. Uh, so they're, they're oh, these three sisters in yeah. chess where the parents, the, the father specifically wanted to do an experiment that he figured he could raise uh, kids but before they were even born, he could raise kids to either be great chess players mm -hmm. or great tennis players. And he and his wife uh, decided they would raise them as chess players. And all of them became the three best women in yep. the world. One of them was in the top 10 for men in the world and maybe the best player in the world for a while. And uh, but he, he wrote this huge book called Chess, which just has it has 5000 positions in it. And it, it was it's categorized like here's all the mate in two positions. Here's all the checkmate in three mm -hmm. positions. Here's all bishop end games, you know, and so then you would have them study these types of micro skills over and over mm -hmm. and over again all day. So I think learning all the micro skills, you're right, like breaking it down into categories, no matter what you're interested in is, is important. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and also just recognizing, you know, which micro skills you can leverage, like which ones are closest to you. Like if you don't have the time to practice all of them and to get good at all of them, which are the ones you're strongest at? Like, how can mm. I actually play to my strengths? So, so you don't try to 
So that's always an interesting thing. Uh, if I'm trying to hack it, if I'm trying to get as good as I possibly can quickly, of course, I'm going to have to work on the weaker parts. You know, that's why I'm working with solvers and simulators and, you know, doing doing st stuff like that, because that's my weakness. Like the math is. But how is much my do you spend? Oh, so this is a very interesting but, question. Like how much do you spend on playing to your strengths as opposed to improving your weaknesses? I think if you want it, I think the faster you're going to you're going to get better faster by improving your strengths. That's so interesting. I, I, I remember reading in politics, uh, you know, there's always a question if you're, uh, let's say a candidate is uh, strong with white men, but weak with black women. Mm -hmm. You know, you could think of like a, a yeah. candidate like Trump. Um, the, the similar questions asked, should he campaign to towards black women or should he campaign towards white men? And right. the answer turns out to be play to your strengths, play exactly. to your base. Because it depends on how much time you have. Like if you have 10 years, you want to focus on your weaknesses so that they can become a strength so that you now have that base as well. But if you're in a campaign and you've got a year, play to your strengths, like do what you're good at. And that's the way you're going to be able to gain the biggest edge, figure out where are my edges. And that's, I think, one of the ways that you can get better faster. You know, so it seems like it seems like about my edge? based on what you're saying now, it seems like your your edge is again borrowing from your other ten thousand hours, ob observing people in a slightly different way than how professional poker players would observe people, and then using those observations to place them on a range of hands in a slightly different way than other poker yes. players might. Yes. And so that's your yes. maybe your biggest strength. Yes. Plus, you know, you get experience with many from all your the, the basic study. You get experience with many types of hands and how mm -hmm. to do that in many types yep. of hands. Yep. So you learn the basic play for many types of hands and then how to tweak based on what you're observing. Yeah, so I think I think adjusting to my table, it's like changing how I'm playing based on the people is probably what I'm strongest at. It's also what I want to keep working on because it's hard. Um, and I think if I can get even better at it, that will really improve. So you get better at that uh, by, again, going through more and more hands and understanding the basic play of more and more hands. Yeah, and, and uh, so some of it is more and more hands and others is just, you know, figuring out what else can I apply? You know, where, what else do I have in my background that can help me here? Like, like what? Um, well, like, you know, when I was, when I was writing, um, my dissertation for my PhD, um, we talked about hot decision-making. Like it was all about kind of making decisions when you're, when you're really emotional. Um, and I don't always necessarily think that, you know what, I can take some of those skills and apply it to poker, but it applies directly. Like, how do you actually, how do you identify someone, you know, who is overconfident as opposed to just self-confident, like who's failing to failing to take that into account? And how do you prevent that in yourself? Well, these are things that I knew theoretically from grad school, but that I've never actually really applied practically. Now, let me actually deliberately take that and and see if I can apply it or something and, like that. And so 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 what do you think? Do you think uh what what's your final consensus on the ten thousand hour rule? I mean, on a, I'm I'm very anti the ten thousand hour rule because I think that it's so, there's so much individual difference. I think you need to practice and practice deliberate practice is essential, but it's not um, it's not sufficient. Um, in I addition guess... to practice, you need other things. You need talent. So even the the sisters that you talked about, the Polgar sisters, they all got to very different levels. Right. Um. So some of them were clearly much more talented than others. Right. But let's let's change so, the ten thousand hour rules though. To, to take out the words 10,000 hours to be best in the world to 10,000 hours to reach your peak potential? Well, so I think that for some people to reach their peak potential, um, it will take 1,000 hours. And for others, it will take 50,000 hours and they won't be as good as the, the person who who took 1,000 hours. And some people, you know, just keep learning their whole life and they, they're never going to they're never going to reach their peak potential because they're geniuses. I wonder though and if so it's like, like a has, bell curve though. So like the average person who's moderately talented, most people are moderately talented at a whole bunch of things. They'll take the 10,000 hours, but someone like Dan Negreanu say who 20 years ago was probably already among the best in the world. Uh, you know, he reached it pretty quickly. Um, but I also think that, I mean, it's not just that, like we also have to talk about genetics. We also have to talk about, predispositions. We have to talk about opportunities. Um, there's so many things other than the 10,000 hours. And I think if you give with some people, if you give them still like all the opportunity to practice in the world, they're never going to get that good. 
um, because say, you know, they're, they have to deal with all this other stuff. So they're never fully focused on it. You know, I think, I think we need to realize that it's a necessary component, but it's far from sufficient to reach your peak. You, it's more than talent. It's, I mean, it's more than practice. It's also, I don't think that self-awareness is practice. You know, I don't think that kind of critical thinking is practice. I don't think that those kinds of things, you, you have to practice those in other domains, but I don't think it's something that you get from from kind of just practicing, practicing, practicing. Yeah, and I guess, I guess, like, take you as an example going into poker. It's, again, it's sort of like you learn the rules of grammar in a couple of different languages. One is just studying to get a PhD mm -hmm. taught you the art of learning. Yep. Then the topic of your PhD, which all dealt with risk and uncertainty and decision making, that is directly applies to poker, but you learned it in a more general case and yep. in a more philosophical case or a more academic setting. But you were able to take components of that and apply it to other situations. Yep. Uh, and then studying Sherlock Holmes and con men, essentially poker is a, a, a kind of a safe way for everybody to learn, learn the art of conning each other because yeah. yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not like specifically cons, but essentially that's what you're, you're doing. You're all conning each other throughout the whole game. Absolutely. And it's also, you know, in a, in a way, poker is also the art of storytelling. You have to tell a compelling story that weaves everything together. That's believable. That's it's, the way. It's interesting that you say that because in the game that you analyzed or in the hand that you analyzed uh, where he played them in this yeah. or an unorthodox manner, he wasn't able to tell yeah, a consistent exactly. story. So that's what. His story made no sense. So, so, so since his story made no sense, you figured, okay, time to, if I, if you kept was doing something that made sense then he has to go out. Exactly. And that helped you there. Exactly. Uh, it's interesting that the art of storytelling is 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 part of this. Yeah. Um, hmm. But storytelling is actually a good way to kind of, to think about the 10,000 hours. You can spend hundreds of thousands of hours writing and never become a good writer, never become a brilliant writer, never become a novelist who's going to live through the ages. It's like music. You know, I can I can play piano for hundreds of thousands of hours and I'm never going to be a, a composer or a great musician like just because I have zero talent in that area I can become a very competent technically piano player but that's about it um, I'm never going to become you know Mozart or to to uh, talk about a modern example that you and I talked about before the podcast Brad Meldow I'm never going to be Brad Meldow the, that guy's brilliant you know I'm in my mind there's something there that no amount of practice is ever going to be able to give me so so uh uh what do you think where do you think you're gonna go with this now are you gonna maybe stop writing and become just a professional <laughs> poker player no, never. what if you can make 20 million dollars playing professional poker i love writing too much writing is who i am and what i've always done and it makes me happy in a way that nothing else can and it fulfills me in, in that way um and so i'm always going to be a writer um but Hey, if I make twenty million dollars, I'll keep playing poker. <laughs> so, so I definitely and, and the thing about writing is you can do it all over the world. It doesn't really matter, and poker brings you to fascinating locations where there are fascinating stories. So there's there's definitely a version of the future where I do both. I mean, I love uh, I love I love activities where it takes you into a subculture that's just yeah. interesting and fascinating. Like poker's got a very specific subculture, and writing. Writing has its own pockets of subculture too, but you're often just by definition, you're writing by yourself yeah. most of the time. Yeah. Whereas but, poker is a very social, unless you're doing it online only, yeah. poker is a very social game. Oh, for sure. And it, that definitely takes me out of my comfort zone because I'm used to just, you know, being an introvert at, by myself doing would, my writing. Would you say a weakness of yours is doing what we talked about before, what Dan Negreno does, which is controlling the table through speech play? I can't do that. I, I can't do speech play at all. I'm just quiet. Mm -hmm. I can I talk to people when I'm not playing. I, I like to be friendly. Um, I think that's important. I want people to enjoy it. Um, I want people to enjoy the game and to have a nice table. Um, but I don't actually ever talk during a hand. But but self awareness when someone's trying to control you is important. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So if if I were playing with Daniel and Daniel started talking to me during a hand, I'm not responding. Hmm. That's just blank. Yeah. No, I, I don't. I don't respond when people talk to me in hands. So you're going to the World Series in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Obviously, you hope to win it. What's the prize? 
Um, who knows? It depends on how many people play. What was the prize last year? I think it was a little over eight million dollars. Eight million dollars. Yeah. Gosh. So what is it? And then this book's coming out when? Um, not quite sure. Um, aiming for summer or fall 2019. And originally it was going to be, you pushed it back because you're doing, you're winning so much money in poker. You decided yeah. to push it back a little bit. Yeah. What's the, what's the story premise for why you're pushing back the book? Um, well, because the story has evolved in ways that we didn't expect. And so it's not over yet. So it's not just like a year in poker. Right. It's so now, now it's, can I hit the best? Yeah, exactly. So it's evolved. You have to be one of the things that poker teaches me is you have to be comfortable just not knowing. And that's actually always been one of my strengths. I've never had a traditional career path. I've always kind of zigzagged and just done things that sometimes people have said, are you insane to do this? Like, that's not how you advance in this world. So maybe that's another thing so, you bring is yeah. uh, uncertainty yeah. on career, uncertainty on yeah. money year to year. I'm, uh, I'm okay with that. That's a, that's a, that's a hard skill. A lot of yeah. people aren't okay with that. Yeah. Cause some years you could lose money. Exactly. Then most jobs you can't lose money. Yes. Yep. Well, uh, Maria Konnikova, I've been, dying for an entire year to talk about this very topic on the podcast with you. So I'm so glad you you came in today and I feel honored. We've played poker a few times during, during this process of yours. Uh, I encourage people to read your other two books first, the Sherlock Holmes book and your book on uh, confidence men, con men. And then I cannot wait until this book comes out. Thank you. Thank you. Well, when, have you been writing it along the way? Yeah, I've been writing lots of scenes um, and kind of taking notes. And yeah, so there's a lot of material. And of course, we'll come back on the podcast before the book comes out. That would be a lot of fun. And we'll have to play poker. Yeah, yeah. We should play. Well, you, you're all up at the at the building all the time. Next yep. time you take, take a lesson, I have a whole poker set, That's, as you know. Yes. So uh, we should organize a poker game even. Let's do Get it. Get a couple people in the area and, and play. That would be a lot of fun. Excellent. Well, thanks again for coming on the podcast. Marie. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, thank you for listening to the James Altucher show on YouTube today. I have a really special brand new episode coming out next week, but you can watch it early. Just click on the link right here or subscribe to the channel when you click on my face. And one more thing, don't forget to click the bell. I'll see you next time.